Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Locke, Director of Marketing, Membership, and Education here at the Society for the Advancement of Material and Process Engineering. Today's webinar is being produced by SAMPI's very own content manager, Brianna Condon, who will, you will hear from uh, shortly and during the webinar. Um, some housekeeping items. Uh, please note that uh, you're free to submit your questions in the Q&A feature, either before or during the presentation. Brianna and our speakers will be looking for them throughout the program. We'll also be sharing links and pieces of information in the chat section, so keep an eye there for more information. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to all of today's FAA speakers, who you will hear from shortly. While we're waiting for our registrants to join us, I'll share with you some, up, some upcoming SAMPI events. So go to your calendar, um, pop up your calendar app, and jot these down. The first two of our uh, February webinars are complementary. The first is an all new webinar series that looks inside the pages of the latest issue of the SAMPI Journal. This webinar on February 17th is on fiber placed prepeg lattice structures for space applications, which is in relation to the published article, um, cover article in the January, February issue of the SAMPI Journal. Our second complimentary SAMPI webinar is on February 25th and covers today's strategic impact and the future of composites for NASA's 21st century missions, which is sponsored by the SAMPI Public and Government Engagement Committee. In March, we have a, a SAMPI tooling workshop um, and that's on March 16th and the 17th. It's a two day workshop. And this workshop hosts the world's top tooling company technologists presenting new advancements, conducting online demonstrations, informative presentations, and participating in panel discussions. So that should be a fun and dynamic uh, two-day workshop. And then also, lastly, stay up to date on all of these events by checking the SAMPI events calendar, um, which is on the SAMPI North America's website. And Brianna will be adding that link um, to this calendar in the chat section. <laughs> So note that this webinar recording will be made available to you following this live presentation. And with that, thank you again, everyone for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to turn things over to Cindy Ashforth, Senior Technical Specialist for Composites at FAA. Cindy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about uh, the relationship between uh, SAMPI and JAMS. Um, we go back a few years um, where the FA has held our annual reviews at SAMPI events and our JAMS principal investigators often present in other sessions and tracks at SAMPI. Um, JAMS research uh, promotes student interaction with industry. We encourage, you know, we are encouraged that SAMPI supports knowledge transfer between academia and industry, uh, which benefits, you know, industry resource needs and continuous education for the existing workforce. Our research is generally focused on uh, near-term applications through our industry partnerships. And the pairing with SAMPI supports these efforts to link our projects to industry and the larger research community to leverage similar, similar efforts and learn from feedback. Um, we think the SAMPI audience is perfectly suited to provide meaningful and impactful feedback on FAA-sponsored research. And we are very pleased to be speaking with you today. So um, the next speaker is Dr. Amet Ozdekin, and I will let him continue. Thank you again. Thank you, Cindy. I'll start sharing my screen so that we can get going. All right. Uh, so thank you, Cindy, again. Also, I want to thank everyone uh, taking the time and joining us today for this presentation. Uh, my name is Ahmed Ostekin. I am the program manager uh, of the FAA Advanced Material and Structural Safety Research Program. Uh, the group of structure and materials engineers that I'm part of uh, are with the Aviation Research Division based at the FAA Technical Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, first, quick, quick bit of a background on myself. I'm an aeronautical engineer, uh, also specialized in industrial and systems engineering. 
Uh, I participated in a multiple FAA-funded research uh, programs since 2007 at different capacities uh, as researcher, technical lead, or principal investigator. Uh, I joined the Federal Aviation Administration in 2016, and since 2017, I helped manage and coordinate uh, the FAA-funded research on advanced materials, through which we also sponsored the Joint Center of Excellence uh, for Advanced Materials and Structures, COE JAMS in short. I also serve as the COE Program Manager for JAMS, representing the sponsoring organization within the FAA. So Sampi, when Sampi gave us this opportunity, uh, my colleagues and I decided to approach this presentation in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll give an overview of the FAA research program itself. I'll cover uh, program scope and objectives, uh, introduce the FAA team managing uh, and overseeing the program, and talk about its regulatory basis and funding source. And we'll try to show how the COE jams fits into this picture. Uh, at the end of my part, I'm going to briefly talk also about the research topics that, that, that uh, this research program will be focusing on for the next five years. So my aim with this high level look at the, at, at the program is to provide basic background information that everyone who may be interested in taking part in FAA funded research should know. So in the second part of my, of, of this presentation, my colleagues will take over and they're going to walk us through uh, a number of projects that we selected to highlight for today's presentation. So if you have any questions, as uh, Chris uh, mentioned earlier, uh, during our talk, please submit them through the Q&A session and someone from our end will try to address them either during our talk or at the end of the session when we have the Q&A part of this, uh, this virtual webinar. Um, so let's start with, uh, so let's start with uh, looking at the, the, the object and scope of the FA funded research in general. So in line with FA's uh, core mission, uh, of course, safety is at the center of all our research activities. FA research goals for continued operational safety are defined by service experience. And we work uh, closely with our industry partners to identify potential safety concerns. And we rely heavily on knowledge transfer when determining research topics and projects. Uh, additional FAA research helps support certification efficiency of current and emerging advanced material technologies. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though, as a rule of thumb, FAA does not develop new technology for aviation industry. So our research often leverages other government initiatives as well, uh, as well as we use expertise from public-private partnerships, either through, through Air Transportation Center of Excellence Structure or other uh, frameworks that, that government has provided to us. So a key feature of FAA-funded research uh, is that we make its output, the output of the research, such as test data and analysis of results publicly available. But we strive more than just making the information public. Uh, one of the main goals of the FAA research is knowledge transfer. So to that end, we organize seminars and training classes uh, to improve safety awareness across the larger uh, aviation community. Uh, more specifically, though, we use outcome of the FAA-funded research to support development of industry standards and guidelines uh, for publication by various international standards organizations. Of course, FAA's uh, research interests go uh, beyond advanced materials. Uh, there are a number of research programs that FAA uses to, to, uh, to perform research on different topics covering all modes of civil air transportation from unmanned aircraft systems to commercial uh, space transfer uh, transportation. Scope and objective of these programs um, are identified by a set of research requirements written three years in advance. And in the year of execution, we revisit these requirements uh, and make adjustments based on changing priorities for that year or the research budget available for that year. So some of these research programs also sponsor a center of excellence to fund academic research 
uh, in their specific areas of interest. So in that context, this program also sponsors COE jams. So the, each federally funded research, uh, uh, research program and a center of excellence sponsored through that research program must have a regulatory basis to exist. So as for jams, uh, this basis is provided by the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Uh, which explicitly requires the FAA uh, to continue operations of the center indefinitely. So budget of, the, of this program uh, is provided by the Congress uh, as a separate line item in the appropriation bill for the fiscal year. Typically, uh, Congress also gives specific instructions to the FAA regarding how to spend the research dollars appropriated for that fiscal year as well. So as for uh, the Advanced Material Research Program, this explanatory text may also include specific references to jams as the vehicle to fund research. So in this slide, uh, I include the text of the uh, congressional direction for the budget line item of our program for this fiscal year and highlighted the specific language uh, referring to jams. So to meet this uh, regulatory requirement, FAA team uh, works with JAMS universities um, and our industry partners to identify projects that support the research requirements that we have already developed for that year. Subsequently, JAMS universities put together uh, their proposals and packages and submit them to us through grants.gov. Uh, we evaluate their proposals and if recommended, if you recommend them for funding, we submit a grant request package to the Office of the Secretary of Transportation, which ultimately approves COE grants. So one of the main benefits, uh, and there are many, uh, of sponsoring research through JAMS uh, is the requirement for cost matching. So as part of the proposal for a COE award, member universities must show one-to-one -one, uh, cost match or in-kind contributions from a non-federal source. So which could come from state or local government or from universities' own resources or from an industry or private partner who might be interested in the research and would like to sponsor it directly. So in a sense, COE funding structure allows FAA to double its investment in aviation research. So finally, for those of you who might be interested in the research dollars awarded to JAM schools, I have included that information as well in this slide. So joint COE for advanced materials is one of the six uh, currently active FAA air transportation uh, centers of excellence. So JAMS was established in 2004 uh, as, a, as joint centers, uh, call, and, and the joint centers, one uh, is led by uh, the Wichita State University uh, which is called Composites uh, and Advanced Materials COE, CCAM. The other is led by the University of Washington, which is called COE for Advanced Materials uh, in Transportation Aircraft Structure, MTES. So uh, currently there are nine member universities supporting JAMS. Uh, in addition to the two lead universities, member schools include uh, University of California, San Diego, uh, Auburn University, Mississippi State University, University of Utah, Oregon State University, Washington State University, and Florida International University. So JAMS uh, continues to be a very successful program for FA over the years. Uh, we are very happy about the level of industry engagement that JAMS universities achieved uh, through partnerships with industry and go other government initiatives, including international collaborations. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, Workforce education and knowledge transfer is at the, at the center of the FAA JAMS program. For example, students, both graduate and undergraduate, who participate in FAA research uh, funded through JAMS may receive job offers uh, from our partners and may want to, to, to industry to take up positions carrying over the knowledge that they've acquired through the JAMS program. Additionally, uh, our researchers and principal investigators actively contribute to various industry standards organizations and working groups. 
so our program is managed by, by an FAA team composed of uh, program sponsors and research performers. Uh, sponsors uh, define research requirements uh, and identify program priorities. Uh, within the FA, they are also the primary end user of, of the research product of, of this research program. Organizationally, sponsors are usually part of the one of the five lines of business supporting the FA administration. Uh, this program is sponsored by Dr. Larry Ilsevich, Chief Scientific and Technical Advisor for Composites, Cindy Ashford, Senior Technical Specialist for Composites. Uh, she talked briefly about the Sampy Jams connection uh, as part of the introductions. Uh, and Joseph Pelletier, Sister for Crash Dynamics. So they are with the policy and innovation group supporting the aircraft certification, uh, which is part of the aviation safety office. So on the performer side, we manage research projects, program portfolio, and its budget. Including myself, there are six technical monitors, all engineers, uh, overseeing FAA-funded research projects. And you are going to be hearing from my colleagues at the end of this session at the, when, when they highlight a, couple of, a few projects that we have selected for this talk. So some of the FAA-funded research activities are performed at the FAA Tech Center facilities as well. However, majority of the research project we sponsor are outsourced. So to that end, we work with industry partners uh, and other government agencies and academia, mostly through the COE program uh, to perform needed research. Uh, so our program has two main drivers. First, to investigate potential safety concerns identified by service experience. Here, the focus is uh, to maintain operational safety of advanced composites already certified by the FAA and currently being used in aviation products. Second, to cultivate a knowledge base that industry and FAA needs to help certification of new and emerging material technologies currently being developed and used in future aviation products. Our research initiatives produce information that may help FAA and aviation industry to move towards a process and material standardization. Uh, additionally, uh, our work helps create data to understand how advanced materials behave in service conditions. Uh, we have projects that study long-term durability, uh, aging of composite bonded structures, damage tolerance and fracture mechanics, just to mention a few. So uh, we also evaluate candidate new technologies uh, to detect damage and impending failure of components. And another area that we focus is the documentation of industry best practices to help standardize maintenance and repair procedures. Uh, let's take a quick look at our main program focus areas. Uh, on this slide, you can see four main areas that FA has identified for advanced materials by looking at its own research needs for the next five years. So first one is to support development of guidelines for characterizing new material forms and assessing manufacturing maturity. Uh, second area focuses on studying long-term behavior uh, uh, of advanced materials and, and uh, of new material forms and associated maintenance activities. Uh, third research area is the investigation of dynamic behavior of advanced structure. In other words, we study crashworthiness aspects of not just advanced composites, but also uh, additive the manufacturing the manufactured components. Finally, FAA research also aims to evaluate methods to characterize uh, uh, composites to tie these methods to best practice design and certification principles. Uh, here, I have also listed research topics, uh, which adds more detail to these main uh, focus areas that, that was identified. Uh, but I'm not planning to go over them. Uh, I encourage you to follow up with us offline, though, if you would like to hear more about these topics. So before we move on to the second part of this presentation, I want to briefly talk about the JAMS research portfolio itself. So since 2017, FAA has awarded 71 grants to JAMS universities. And the current JAMS research portfolio includes 39 active projects that I have listed on this slide. Um, uh, I apologize for this slide. 
for being a bit of an eye chart, but I hope this helps you visualize the current GEMS program in its entirety. So this concludes my part of uh, this talk, but our team presentation is continuing. Uh, we have selected a number of projects that we wanna highlight and my colleagues uh, from the tech center uh, will provide uh, a quick summaries of these selected projects. With that, I wanna leave the floor to my colleagues, uh, Lynn Pham, Dave Stanley, uh, Danielle Stevens, and Kevin Stonecker. Lynn. Please take Thank care. you. Thank you, Ahmed. Hello, everyone. My name is Lynn Pham, and I'm a research engineer and currently support the FAA Advanced Material and Structural Safety Research Program at the Tech Center. Today, I'm giving you an overview of three ongoing research under this program. The first project is Impact Damage Tolerance Guidelines for Stiffen Composite Panels. This project is performed at University of California in San Diego. Uh, the principal investigator are Dr. Kim and Dr. Lanza Descalia. Our industry partners are Boeing, Bombardier, United Airlines, Delta, DuPont, and JC Halpin. I'm sure most of us have been at an airport at least once and have seen catering trucks or cargo trucks providing services for aircraft. The ground surface equipment bump into aircraft all the time. They are an ongoing and a major source of composite internal damage that is often difficult to visually observe from the outside of an aircraft. So there is a need for external non-destructive evaluation methods that are capable of detecting the damage quickly to help in decision-making if further assessment is needed. So the objective of this project is to investigate damage tolerance of stiffened composite panel using airframes subjected to impacts by quantifying detectable and non-detectable damage characteristics and relating ultrasonic guided wave measurements to damage states and residual strength. And you can see the upper top figures show an incident when a cargo truck bumped into the air land fuselage such impact could create internal damage like stringer hue crack as shown at the next figure with, no to, with little to no visual indication externally. The lower figures show a non-destructive equipment that use ultrasonic guided wave technique developed by University of California, San Diego. This equipment consists of a mini impactor and two sensors. The MIDI impactor generates a broadband frequency up to 500 kilohertz, and it is capable of detecting damage in deeper internal structure components like frame shear ties or string or hat away from the skin as shown at the bottom right figure. So the result, this, this result is promising since current conventional non-destructive inspection tool like Pulse April ultrasound, A-scan, and C-scan system are limited to their detection ability to only detect damage within the skin and stringer flanges. The research finding will be used for guidance materials as well as possible content for composite material handbook 17. Next slide, please. Amen. Thank you. So our second project is FAA research requirement on lightning strike of composite structure conducted at Wichita State University. The principal investigator are Jeff Phillips and Aliza Gonzalez. Existing standard um, aerospace recommended 5416A define two test methods for detection of voltage sparks in metallic structures, the photographic methods and gases mixture. So both techniques require to be related to a 200 microjoule minimum fuel ignition threshold induced by the charge of a standard voltage spark source. The standard defined the past criterion as either demonstrating the absence of a minimum light detected by camera or no ignition of a flammable gas mixture. So these 200 microjoule voltage spars are considered to be generated as a result of a sparking occurring between metallic components. 
However, when com carbon fiber composite material are involved, these sources, uh, other sources of sparking appear, which have not, not yet been properly characterized in, in regard to ignition of aircraft fuel. The light emission and sparking sources include voltage phenomena called ash glows, incandescent particles, and sparking sources. I'm sorry, and hot gases injected from fashion or toys. The existing photographic test methods outlined in 5416A is not very closely linked to the heat energy of the ignition sources and resulting in large number of false values or cases in which light is detected, but ignition of the flammable mixture will not occur. So the objective of this project is to develop a new detection methodology for incandescent ignition source to reduce the number of ash glow failures that occur with the current photographic methods. The test photo, as you can see from the upper figure, he converted from the standard camera after put format, the red, green, blue color model to the hue, saturation, and brightness color model. The study show that the ignition could be predicted by analyzing the hue histogram of detected light emission source. As shown at the bottom figure, the incandescent signature E present when both continuous spectrum and peak at critical yellow hue are observed. For this project, we work closely with SAE Lightning Committees, Lightning Laboratory in US, Europe, and Asia. And of course, the research finding will support guidance materials, augment existing 5416A standards, and also provide possible content for composite material handbook 17. Next slide, please. The third project is Lightning Protection of Aircraft Handbook Update. Uh, this project is conducted by MTS, the Lightning Technology Company, and the principal investigator is Andy Bomber. As you know, the current handbook reference in Advisory Circular 20-155A were published in 1989, which is very outdated and needs an update to better reflect advances in aircraft lightning protection technologies. So the object of this project, pretty much so explained, is to update the 1898 handbook to include these areas of, of interest. The fuel tank lightning protection for transport airplanes, integrating lightning protection in composite primary structures, electrical and electronic system lightning protection and related tests for those system with catastrophic failure conditions. Example of improper composite structure lightning protection and associates person, forensics. Aircraft specific technical differences and best engineering practices for all product types. And the use of simulation and modeling in both certification and engineering evaluation of design. So the, update, the updated handbook will have the same 18 chapters as the current 1989 handbook, and it will be made available to the public when it is completed, hopefully by the end of this calendar year. I think that's it for me. I thank you everyone. And at this point, I'll pass to our next speaker, Dave Stanley. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Dave Stanley. I'm also a research engineer at the, uh, the uh, William J. Hughes Technical Center in New Jersey. Um, so good morning and afternoon, depending on where you're at in the US. Um, I'm the technical monitor for multiple composite related grants, really focusing, I guess, mostly on uh, structural predictive capabilities um, and certification efficiency. And I recently got added on to uh, uh, some crash worthiness related work. Um, for today, I've decided to just focus on two of our, uh, of our programs, the JAMS, uh, that cover two different uh, structure product forms. Uh, the first one, as you can see here, is a discontinuous fiber composite, um, or for our love of acronyms, we call them DFCs for short, if you're familiar. 
Uh, this program is spearheaded uh, by one of the, the lead COE universities, it's University of Washington, AMTAS. Um, and, and particularly the, the PIs involved in this are, are Dr. Marco Salviato and Dr. Uh, Jinky Yang. Um, generally speaking, as you, you are likely aware, most of the primary composite structures today are what we, I guess we call a continuous composite form. Um, they're fabricated from some layered unidirectional plies or fabrics or they're wound continuously with tape. Uh, and as you can imagine, when you create a structure as large as an aircraft, um, there's bound to be some sections that are scrapped. And uh, the FAA kind of sees in the future that this scrap uh, or OEMs are gonna look to this scrap to be recycled or have some amount of recyclability. Um, and one possibility of being able to recycle this kind of scrap material uh, is through the uh, the use of discontinuous fiber composite structures or parts. Um, so DFC is just an example of one, um, is in the center of the slide. Uh, they consist of small pieces, which we call platelets. Uh, and these can be, uh, you know, pieces of uh, a single ply. Uh, and they generally are stacked in some random orientation. Um, they can be molded into parts or laid up in the parts. Um, and as you guys know, randomness makes things difficult from a certification perspective. Um, so for this program, we decided to kind of uh, use a, a traditional building block approach, really to try and focus on the fundamental mechanisms that can dominate uh, discontinuous fiber composite structural behavior uh, and, and working to identify those as well. Um, so as such, we start with a, with a coupon testing program. Um, where the coupon tests were uh, initiated uh, and you know, fabricated by the University of Washington team. Um, I do you want to note that you know we realize it's not an all-encompassing um, you know catch-all for these kind of uh, aircraft structures, um, but we thought it was a good starting point. Uh, but we do realize there's some other fabrication uh, inconsistencies that can show up. That's some future work for us. Um, so if we focus on the objectives of what this program is, is, is aiming to do, is to develop uh, an experimental protocol for the characterization, characterization of fracture toughness for DFCs and uh, investigate any kind of fundamental effects that are related to the material morphology, like the platelet size or the distribution of platelets, uh, the relative randomness in a part, uh, or geometrical features like structure thickness and notch radii. Um, and, and how those affect the fracture behavior. Uh, through the program, uh, we can test, uh, or we'd like to develop some kind of predictive capability. So we've done some work uh, computationally um, to uh, hopefully describe or capture uh, some of these mechanics. And the goal is to use these as a certification guidelines or best practices uh, for DSC structures. Um, currently, most of the work has been completed on thermoset DFCs. Um, there is a, a, a part, a DFC part that is currently flying. Um, it's the, the window frame in the, the 787 Dreamliner. Um, but uh, I know companies are looking towards developing uh, you know, multiple structures throughout the aircraft made from DFCs. Um, one important uh, highlight here that I have for, for prior research outcomes um, is that there's a clear size effect law uh, that uh, kind of popped up. Um, so here, if we look on the right, um, it's important to note that, again, there is a, a tendency for these structures to perform differently depending on uh, platelet sizes and geometry of the part. And depending on, kind of if you plot this out, you can see on the right plot that uh, for specific combinations uh, of these uh, these factors, the structural performance of DFC parts will be dominated by a strength criterion, which is the horizontal line at the top, or they even uh, kind of convert into a linear elastic fracture mechanics behavior. Um, so that was a, an important size effect that you know we want to look forward to in the future um, and kind of investigate further uh, with real molded parts. Um, for future tasks, uh, we are uh, moving away a little bit from thermoset DFCs and looking into thermoplastic DFCs, uh, and there's some, been some development of using like CT scanning methodologies um, or automated scanning methodologies to try to help map platelet orientation to improve predictive capabilities. 
Um, I also just like to point out we have some of the, the industry partners um, who have uh, you know aided us uh, with some guidance from University of Washington. Uh, you know they're heavily uh, partnered with Boeing as well as some material suppliers like Sekisui, Toure, and Hexel. Uh, next slide, please. All right, the uh, next featured research program is a multi-year program that is due to wrap up in uh, 2021 at the moment. Um, this program focuses on the development and evaluation of fracture mechanics for sandwich composites. Um, and particularly this, this grant uh, with the University of Utah uh, was focused on test method development to assess predictive capabilities uh, for sandwich composites as related to notch sensitivity, damage formation, and growth. The PI for this program is Dr. Dan Adams, um, but I would like to point out that he is actively engaged in a, a larger sandwich disrupt bond group. Um, Lynn mentioned it briefly, uh, it's CMH17, which is the composite material handbook, where there's also other industry partners like the uh, National Institute of Aerospace, NASA, the IR, and DTU. Um, it's really just another organization that works to compile guidelines and best practices and lessons learned uh, through research um, with industry and academia partners. Um, the main objective of this program is developing test methods to assess the predictive capabilities um, and particularly to evaluate, predict, and monitor you know, phase sheet core disbond growth, which can be an issue that kind of plagues uh, you know, current product forms. Um, we can see two images on the right, just showing a kind of schematically a disbonding of the face sheet in the core where the crack is kind of following along the adhesive line or the disbond kind of starts to uh, deviate into the core material um, and the associated test that's working to uh, kind of predict that. And then it's a generic compression test uh, for sandwich damage tolerance. Uh, the current tasking, um, there are a number of uh, reports and standards that are being uh, put through the ASTM committees. And we currently have six that are in the pipeline and, uh, or, and or balloting procedures. Um, they include sandwich open hole compression and flexure, mixed mode bend testing, a single cantilever beam and two additional sandwich to, uh, damage tolerance standards. Um, so some future work for 2021 is we'd like to really wrap up these standardizations um, and uh, you know, help begin or publish our technical reports by, by 2022. Um, and uh, also evaluate these methodologies with, with actual impact as defined by ASTM uh, D7766. Uh, and with that, that is my portion. So I'll hand it off to the next presenter, this is Danielle Stevens. Thanks. All right, hello everyone. Um, the first program I'm going to discuss is a newer program. It is the evaluation of age structural bonds and rotor blades. This program stemmed from in-service failures, and in this case, it was for composite rotor blades. Now, different helicopter accidents showed evidence of environmental degradation in the bond strength and the bond processing problems. For example, that bottom left image was caused by main rotor blade pocket separation, and that caused um, adhesive strength failure and sandwich bond, sandwich disc bond failure. Right now, there's limited capability of NDI techniques to detect understrength bonds. So it's, it's really important to understand that aging mechanism on unbonded rotor blades. So the purpose of this program is to investigate those unknown behaviors of age bonded composite rotor blades and also field repairs to gain a fundamental understanding of the aging mechanism of these bonded dynamic structures. So with this general statement, the FAA has a few areas of focus that we're, we're interested in gathering data. Um, first is comparing existing repairs on old blades and new repairs on old blades to that of a repair on a brand new blade. Also comparing the state of adhesive on an old blade to that of a production level new blade. And then with that, if we have these new blades and we need to artificially age them, we have to make sure that the accelerated aging program that we're doing is actually representative of what's happening in real life. So one of the objectives of this project is to broaden the FAA's knowledge of, um, of in the area of composite rotor blades and also address the, the current gaps in publicly available data and analysis and also to document best practices. This program is gonna be a collaborative test effort between the FAA and NIAR. And 
we have and we're adding more industry partners you know every day to aid us in, in as part of a, a steering committee and this research is really to be accomplished in, in three broad phases the first is the acquisition of test articles which that's what we're doing now and it's been an ongoing effort and the second is the test rig design and fabrication which is also what we're we're working on right now one test rig will be housed at at NIAR's atlas lab and that's that bottom middle design and another will be housed at the tech center at the structures and materials lab and that's the bottom right design that you see there and finally the last broad phase will be the structural evaluation the actual structural testing of these blades and the logistics of all that will be done in our done with input from our, our steering committee next slide please next i'd like to talk about our thermoplastic um, resin composite research the interest in thermoplastics isn't necessarily new. There is definitely a push for thermoplastics in aviation in the 80s, and it never really took hold because of you know, the high cost compared to thermoset materials, the high production cost. But now there's a strong comeback in interest as the manufacturing processes and the technologies have matured and become more economically feasible. So these high performance thermoplastic resin systems with, with reinforcements are finding wider use in, in structural applications and it's for a variety of reasons there there's generally no autoclave curing they have high material toughness they can withstand tougher environments they don't have um, as strict cleaning requirements and no shelf life they can be stored at ambient temperatures and another one of the really large benefits is that after processing the materials can be melted and then remolded without really affecting the polymers physical properties which is great for recyclability and it lends itself to things like um, unique processing methods such as thermoplastic welding. Now, these factors together, they lend to benefits such as you know, increased production rates, increased performance, and of course, lower costs. So with these benefits, there's definitely challenges that limit the widespread adoption. Thermoplastics are, are very process sensitive and they're extremely sensitive to, to processing variables. And a big challenge with that is the lack of established best practices and for the FAA, the lack of certification protocols and thermoplastic specific guidance. Now, what this research stems from, um, there are some established protocols for traditional continuous fiber thermoset materials that might apply. But right now what we're doing is trying to look at or adapt or amend what we do have in consideration of thermoplastic materials. One of our, our thermoplastic research programs deals with, with joining methods. And this program we started last year, it looks to develop a framework for the qualification of thermoplastic joints. And that takes into consideration mechanical fastening, adhesive bonding, and, and welding. And the research is, is really divided into four phases or, or tasks. The first task is establishing a steering committee. And that's to help tailor that research effort that was complete, and that was completed last year. Right now where we're focused, uh, that red arrow is task two, which is really heavy on the bonding research and taking into account the different surface prep methods, the different chemical treatments, surface characteristics, and also where we are now is the joint testing. And a really big part of this is the applicability of the, the lessons learned and the protocols established for thermoset bonded joints. And the idea is to kind of develop best practices following the comparison of the surface prep methods and also the, joining, the joint strength results. Now, task three focuses on the assessment and the identifying critical processing parameters and joint testing for welds. With welds, surface prep isn't one of the critical factors, but it can also be examined to see if it provides any potential improvements to, to weld strength and durability. And the different welding techniques were narrowed down to three of the more common methods that were based on industry input. That's uh, resistance welding, induction welding, and ultrasonic welding. Each of these with consideration to how different processing variables um, affect joint strength and durability. From tasks two and three, the bond performance will be compared to the weld performance in order to further examine the advantages and the disadvantages of, of either joining technique. And then finally, that last task after gathering all this data is the development of the qualification framework to include material and process specs, um, test matrices, and acceptance criteria for welds that's based on current requirements or the other way this could go is the determination that there might be a need to develop new standards as well as um, any potential impacts we find on the current certification guidelines. Uh, another key outcome will be to establish industry standard definitions identifying a bond versus a weld and also create certification protocols for the thermoplastic joints. Uh, next slide, please.
Uh, my final slide is oh, one more. <laughs> my final slide is the polymer polymer based additive manufacturing. This research is um, also done with Wichita State and IR. And the use of additive manufacturing is expanding because manufacturers are finding a, a use for these, you know, lighter, more intricate parts that can be created by using additive. However, these materials are very process sensitive and their variability and their repeatability um, are common issues that aren't really well understood. And the sources of variability are both material and process based. So some of the biggest issues are process stability, part quality, reproducibility, and all these things are addressed within the framework of this research. This program and the data gathered are the results of a, a multi-year effort that was used to identify, characterize, understand, and ultimately really control the different subsystems and processing variables as they relate to the, the performance of that final part produced. Now, before this program, there's no real substantial database or database or existing public qualification of an added material. Um, I mentioned that framework for qualification, and that really looks to create documented public guidelines and recommendations for things like material characterization, testing, um, design, and usage. Now, this research was done in phases. It was first, you know, a steering committee in which the research material that was chosen was Ultim 9085 on a specific machine, the Fortis 900 MC, and then developing that qualification framework by addressing different aspects of the material build, like demonstrating machine to machine repeatability, quantifying the different design variables, such as um, build location, build orientation, like that, that image on the bottom right, and then also taking into account different things like environmental conditions. The, the goal of controlling the different process variables is really essential for this whole project to be successful. And we've achieved a, a complete qualified database of this material as well as the qualification statistical analysis, uh, statistical analysis report. Now the, the validation of the framework was done by doing equivalency testing at multiple sites. And there's also a process control document to allow for future equivalency sites to be able to follow these step-by-step -step instructions to configure their system to get you know, consistent, repeatable results. Um, the next phase was the statistical guidelines. And basically, that's just understanding how the different parameters interact with each other and affect the variability in the parts that are produced and how it affects the, the final mechanical property allowables. And then finally, all this information has to get transitioned. And what we're doing now is transitioning this data and these guidelines to standards organizations like CMH17, SAE for the specifications, and um, ASTM for the, the test methods. And for the FAA, these qualification programs really provide an opportunity to, to standardize the means of compliance. Um, this particular program, it's the first publicly, the first public AM qualification database with materials and process specs. And it, it provides a better understanding of the different sources of variability in AM parts. And in the end, the information is publicly available. So what's happening now and in the future for this program is looking to expand it, um, performing qualification on other PBA materials or processes, um, investigating you know, machine, the reasons for the machine variability, and also um, selecting different materials uh, for qualification in the future. Um, I think that's what I have. If any questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A or send them to me in an email later on. Uh, thank you, Danielle, for, for that. Uh, my name is Kevin Stoniker, and I am one of the program managers for the FAA's Metal Additive Manufacturing Research. Uh, and so, you know, just very quickly, additive manufacturing or 3D printing uh, is a process of creating a part one layer at a time. Uh, additive manufacturing is a very broad umbrella uh, term, uh, as you can tell by uh, Danielle covering the, the polymer side. <clears throat> um, but for the programs that I'm going to be covering today, uh, specifically looking at laser powder bed fusion of uh, Thai 64 metal alloy. And so uh, powder bed fusion, uh, the way that this works, essentially the machine spreads a very thin layer of metal powder on a build plate and then uses, in this case, a laser beam as the energy source to melt the powder into the desired shape. Uh, that process is repeated over and over again until your, your full part is complete. Uh, and typically laser powder bed fusion uh, is used for smaller parts uh, due to the limitation of the build chamber size. 
Uh, but the trade-off uh, for size is that it can make very intricate uh, and complicated parts, uh, things featuring things like internal structures and turtle passageways, um, stuff that can't be done using traditional metal processes. Uh, as Danielle mentioned, the challenge with additive uh, and, and also with metal additive here uh, is that the material is created along with the part itself, which leads uh, it open for much higher variability uh, here, uh, comparing that to traditional metal processes. Additionally, while some uh, AM technologies have been around for a long time, they have only recently begun to um, make its way to the FAA for certification in the last few years. Uh, so there is that need for specific standards and guidance material uh, to be generated to help address uh, some of the unique aspects of additive manufacturing. And so all the research that I'm going to be highlighting here, um, the data generated with this research, uh, as Danielle also mentioned, uh, we do try to make as much of it publicly available as we can. Uh, and the FAA uses that information to participate in the development of consensus-based standards, industry standards and guidance material. Uh, so for the first uh, program that I'm gonna cover here, this is the, the Joint Metals Additive Database Definition or JMAD. Uh, this is being led by Wichita State University. As the title suggests, uh, this is a joint program. So it's jointly funded by the FAA and the Department of Defense. It also is, uh, involved with uh, NASA, America Makes, Auburn University, and Boeing as the, the primary partners here. On top of that, there are um, advisory and steering groups that have been set up um, that are open for participation. And so they are comprised uh, kind of widely of uh, participants from industry, academia, and other government agencies. Uh, so for this project, we went, really wanted to make sure that we are um, approaching this program um, in a way that we, it, it's structured to answer uh, the way industry is gonna be using this technology. Uh, and so kind of the, the purpose of this program uh, on the metal side, um, the process of developing material allowables for traditional metal products is very well defined and very well standardized at this point. Again, due to the process sensitive nature of metal additive though, the expectation is there would be additional considerations needed for both the development of material data uh, and for its eventual use. And again, there's no real public guidance or standards that exist yet to help develop and guide that development of that data. Uh, so this program is modeled uh, very closely after the, the polymer program that Danielle did cover. Um, and so it's meant to establish a process that could be used to generate the data for statistically based design allowables. Uh, this program is just getting underway. So uh, we're, we're still in kind of the, the planning phase, but building is supposed to uh, start soon. So uh, really looking forward to developing this, uh, this framework and this data that uh, again will be publicly available. Uh, next slide, please. The next three programs that I'm going to cover are all led by Auburn University. Uh, the first here is on key process variable drift. So the expectation from the FAA is that when applicants approach the FAA to certify a metal additive part, uh, they will propose to use a lockdown process. Essentially, they'll say, uh, we're going to build these parts using X power uh, and Y uh, scan velocity. Um, and so the reality is, uh, while they may say they're using a, a certain um, lockdown parameter set, there's going to be a level of uh, variability uh, to those key process parameters. So, for example, power, laser power may naturally drift uh, plus or minus 5% over maintenance uh, period uh, from that uh, desired set point. So the, the purpose of this program is to one, understand uh, what level of variable drift can be expected for laser powder bed fusion machines. Uh, and then once we have an understanding of what to expect as far as the capability of these parameters to drift from a set point, uh, to design and execute a, a design of experiments that would explore if any mechanical properties are negative, negatively affected by any combination of 
uh, key process parameters drifting. And so uh, we're this one again, we're, we're in the planning phase. Uh, we're trying to uh, outline that the design of experiments, but really looking to see if, for example, if uh, laser power uh, drifts up while uh, scan speed drifts down, um, you know, that could potentially, uh, from process window, could potentially create excess porosity. And so we're understanding uh, the capability of something like that happening from a, a desired set point. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, this project here, also led by uh, Auburn, is looking at effective defects uh, for TIE 64 using laser powder bed fusion. <clears throat> and so here, uh, specifically talking about bulk material. And this work is uh, building on some uh, work done by other organizations that have kind of done uh, process mapping for both um, power and velocity. So that, uh, that little image that I had on the last slide. Uh, and essentially, um, it's part of the kind of the public domain that if you, if you vary power and velocity in certain ways, you can expect different types of porosity uh, to be created. And so this program here um, is intended to create batches of specimens with varying levels of porosity. And then those specimens would be inspected, tested, uh, and subject to post-test tractography in uh, an effort to understand, to uh, characterize, and to catalog which uh, defects are the, the critical ones leading to specimen failure. And so that would be defect type, defect size, shape, uh, and also uh, location, both within the, the bulk material and location relative to other, um, other defects. And so this information would be very useful uh, in trying to develop standards for things like uh, NDI, uh, as far as um, the, the, the smallest flaw that needs to be found in, in these types of processes. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, program being led by Auburn uh, um, is very similar to the, the effective defects work. Uh, however, the, the main difference this time we are looking at uh, surface integrity. So the previous slide was looking at bulk material. All those specimens were uh, fully machined uh, before they're tested. In this program, uh, we're specifically focusing at uh, surface integrity. So that's a combination of surface roughness, but also the near surface uh, material of uh, laser powder bed fusion uh, built uh, specimens. Uh, so with this with laser powder bed, uh, as you're building a part, typically there is a, a contour pass where the outline of the shape uh, is uh, consolidated first, and then the, the bulk uh, volume of the, the part is then filled in second. And so uh, at the end of a build, uh, the as-built parts can have uh, very rough surfaces compared to uh, something that's been machined. And so uh, obviously in fatigue, those rough surfaces can start, uh, can act as uh, crack initiation points. So here, instead of looking specifically at defects, we're looking at characterizing and cataloging what features of the surface and near surface are responsible for crack initiation and growth. Um, and so again, building batches of specimens, inspecting, testing, using uh, full uh, post-test spectrography on all the specimens to kind of build up that knowledge uh, that can be used and trying to quantify if there is a way to, to measure that surface roughness in a meaningful way to um, be able to use um, parts with as-built surfaces. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, the last program that I'm going to cover here is uh, led by the University of Washington. Uh, and so this is um, kind of a high level program looking at the inherent variability to laser powder bed fusion. So this program is structured as a multi partner round robin uh, where we are looking to lock down the process uh, as much as possible, uh, trying to eliminate as many sources of variability as uh, possible. So um, within this program, the, the feedstock material will all be the same. Uh, each participant will have the same make and model machine. They will be using the same uh, build file, the same process um, parameters, and the, 
building to the same process control document. So really trying to lock down everything we possibly can. And this is again, to look at the inherent variability within laser powder bit fusion. So that's on a couple different levels that will hopefully be um, developing data uh, to try and uh, characterize. And so that's uh, within a build. So parts located at different areas of the build plate, uh, build to build. Uh, so on the same machine, uh, one build uh, versus a build done a month later. And then um, machine to machine. So uh, if one partner has multiple machines that they're using, do the two machines uh, create the same mechanical property specimens? Uh, and then finally, facility to facility. Uh, so essentially, uh, partner to partner. Um, and so uh, this information is, is going to be very helpful in trying to understand some of the challenges that are associated with mass producing metal additive parts uh, when you have you're going to have uh, multiple machines at possibly multiple uh, manufacturing sites producing parts. We want to have data that um, lets us know, um, you know, the level of variability to expect so that we can um, safely certify uh, mass production of these parts. Uh, with that, um, that concludes what I had. So I'll pass it back to Ahmed, and I think we're going to start the question portion. Thank you, Kevin. So the, quickly, uh, I believe we are going to be able to share these slides uh, with, with the audience. Uh, look for that email with that link, Ahmed. Uh, so if you, have, uh, if you are interested in uh, more technical detail on JAMS projects, uh, you can access uh, presentations that our principal investigators have put together from these two links. Uh, we didn't have an annual JAMS technical review meeting last year due to COVID-19. Uh, but we are planning to have it have one this year. Uh, date and time is still TBD. Uh, most likely it's going to be a virtual meeting as part of the SAMPI calendar for this year. So stay tuned for that announcement. Hopefully we'll go out in a couple of months. Uh, we'd like to see you all participating in, the, in, in this year's JAMS annual review meeting. Uh, you also have our contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have additional questions. I've seen that there, there's a great Q&A exchange uh, as part of the chat when the presentations were ongoing. Um, so I, uh, yeah, we, we just exceeded our time limit, but I wanna quickly address a couple of questions. First, how can industry take part in JAMS research and what is the process to do so? So there are, couple of options for industry to engage in JAMS program or in FAA funded research programs. First, we have a number of industry programs, uh, industry and government string committees that uh, we have set up for a number of JAMS projects. So these committees provide feedback on research direction and help us understand uh, or help us review the test data and preliminary results and understand that we are moving towards, towards a direction that, that is meaningful and that is helpful for industry as well as the FA. So you can participate in these meetings that we have on a regular basis. Second, if you have a particular research topic that you are interested in and wanted to uh, sort of collaborate with FA, or if you wanted to be more involved in one of our projects, uh, then you can be one of our official industry partners who provides matching or in-kind contribution. So to learn more about these options, you can contact me directly uh, or Cindy or our co-directors, uh, Dr. John Tomlin, which the, which the State University and Dr. Uh, Jihu Yang from University of Washington. So we'll work with you to find uh, the right level of engagement that, that fits uh, you and your organization. So the second question, uh, how can uh, other universities or academic institutions take part in FA funded research? So if you are from a JAMS university, but uh, have not participated in JAMS research yet, or uh, have not participated in our uh, program yet, uh, contact us and your chairs from MTES and CCAM, depending, Dr. Tomlin and uh, Dr. Yang. Uh, depending which one of your institution, uh, which one your institution belongs to, and start a dialogue. If you are not a JAMS university and would like to explore membership or would like to be interested in our program, 
the first step is again to contact the co-chairs from which the state and University of Washington start a dialogue. And at some point they'll pull FAA team into that discussion and we'll take it from there. Uh, however, as uh, I've alluded to uh, in my talk, uh, COE, uh, Center of Excellence Framework, is not the only option that FAA has in its toolbox to sponsor research. Uh, so you, to explore what those options are, uh, you can contact me directly. Uh, so uh, Cindy or anyone from the FAA team would like to chime in, uh, chime in on this uh, or add to this, uh, please do so. Um, and also, if anyone on the FAA team would like to address the question that has been submitted, uh, I guess this is the time to, to, to address those questions. Just want to say thank you for uh, using the Q and A, uh, but I'm I'm willing to uh, to answer any further questions um, that the link provided. You can email me or or even the PIs. Uh, but uh, I know there's been some discussion for types of adhesive that were used, um, and uh, you know, in relation to ASTM. Um, so I could provide some clear answers for that at a later date. Um, but feel free to email me. All right. Um, unless we have any additional comments, uh, again, thank everybody. Thanks everybody for taking the time and participating. Uh, stay tuned for this year's Jams Annual Tech Review meeting, uh, that announcement. And I'm hoping to see everyone uh, there, albeit virtually. Um, and uh, finally, I want to thank Sampi especially Brianna for helping us organize this webinar. Uh, so we uh, well passed our uh, allotted time. Thank mm -hmm. you again. And, and I would like to, unless uh, anyone from our team has any additional comments, I would like to wrap up the session and adjourn the meeting. Excellent. Thank you, Amet, and the, the, the SAMPI, FAA, and JAMS team. Um, much appreciate your time. And we will be in touch with everybody for future information on jams. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks. Bye everyone.